Our speaker today is named Tony Yaboa, and he's a PhD candidate in history. He's been working at it for just six years, he tells me, uh, at Yale University. Before coming to Yale, he did his AB and his MPhil at the University of the Cape Coast um, in Ghana as well. And he just told us that he is, in fact, a native of the city of Kumasi, which he's going to be speaking about today. His research, with the support from a Mellon International Dissertation Research Fellowship, examines the entangled themes of colonial power, the built environment, and community making in one of the greatest West African uh, capitals, Kumasi. Uh, Tony is a contributor to for the OER, which is the Open Educational Resources. I'm not sure I know what that is, Tony. What is that? Yeah, so we try to um, make history accessible to spaces beyond the academy. So we got this is a project by the Office of Bill Gates. So they created it. Okay, very it's, good. It's really for high school students. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Something you know we care a great deal about here because we have a very important educational outreach program. Yeah, something Space like that. Center. Yes. So maybe there will be some room for cooperation uh, amongst us. And um, his work has appeared in History in Africa, the Journal of West African History, The Conversation, and Nursing Cleo. Thank you so much, Dr. Sorella. Um, I would like to. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> oh. No PhD. <laughs> you can call me professor. Professor. Okay, I'll call you professor. Or you can call me Mark. That's even better. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to thank everyone at the African Studies Center here, um, particularly Professor Sorella. Um, who made this visit possible oh. for inviting me? I thank Martin um, Bachman. I, I don't know. He's been working on the Who's logistics. Martin, and... on... Oh, she's still not. Yeah, okay, you okay. can't hear. She's behind that beautiful green space. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, and my friend Dave Plosky, who recommended my work to you, and eventually I'm here. Um, so thank you. And I thank everyone um, for being here. And to those of you joining us by Zoom, I thank you for coming. So let's get started. I'm talking to you about. Um, I was born and bred in this city. I'll, I'll get into that and talk a little bit about my own association with this city. So for now, uh, let's start with the geography of the region. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to assume that I'm in West Africa. right? Uh, so welcome to Kumasi, um, which is the focus, obviously, for uh, this afternoon's garden. Uh, as this West Africa map indicates, Kumasi is one of the major um, metropolis in this region and it is specifically found within the boundary of modern Ghana. And then I'm gonna to go to the next, and then on this map of Ghana, we see that Kumasi is found in this sort of south central part of the, of the country. I'm taking you back to the past. I mean, it is important to note that uh, Kumasi is not just a major city in Ghana or West Africa today, but it was also um, the capital of Asante, which was one of the most formidable West African kingdoms of the 18th and 19th centuries. That's throughout this talk, you hear references to Kumase, which is the capital, and Asante, which is the state, but also refers to the people and the region, right? So I hope you get that. Um, and it, it doesn't confuse anyone. Before getting into the details, I mean, I, I already had a little bit of conversation with, just a little bit with Professor Storilla, but before getting into the details of today's talk, I would like to mention that um, this title is a chapter of a project I'm currently working on, um, which is entitled The West African Garden City, Kumasi in the Making of Global Urban Planning. I look at it from 1874 to 1957. I'd like to briefly discuss an overview of this project to give an idea about how my research is shaping our understanding of the histories of architecture and the built environment. I'm thinking broadly, not just Africa. As I have indicated, I, my research examines the city of Kumasi from 1874 to 1957, showing how the city changed from the local administrative planning system to a colonial scheme under the British. This project sits at the intersection of urban history and African history, making important intervention in each field. In urban history, scholars think of the Garden City as a British or European idea, um, but my research shows a different portrait of local African creativity that predates this invention in Europe. It also proposes a new theory of framework for understanding and studying urbanization by pushing scholars to take the metaphysical conceptions of the built environment more seriously. And here I focus on architecture and local planning design to illustrate this theory. And 
I've talked about, I, I call this theory as anti lumina so it gets a little bit complex to move beyond the, well, the realm of the natural into the physical, the metaphysical world or the world of the noumena. So in African history until recently, and yeah, I don't know, yeah, scholars didn't really study African urban history on its own terms, but they examine it in relation with Europe. This suggests that African urban history came about only because of African interactions with Europeans or colonial impositions. My research deals up on recent scholarship that focus on how local circumstances inspired urban development in the region. But what is interesting about my research is really focusing on the colonial period and highlighting African creativity. So mostly scholars have examined urban, urban processes on the continent pre-colonial encounters, right? But within the colonial period, we are still able to, depending on the sources we use, highlight African creativity. And that is exactly what I'm trying to do with my research. And this is aspects, I mean, I, this is part of the things I'll be discussing today. I employ methods that are familiar to historians. If I'm wrong, tell me, Dave, <laughs> such as oral history and the archives. I also use ethnographic spatial analysis and taking the influence of beliefs and faith on the built environment more seriously. My live experience, as I told Professor Storyla a while ago, of Kumasi also offers me a unique position or methodology from which I'm able to animate abstract illustrations and finding for more history research. While I focus on this one city, my project helped us to think about, to think differently about African history and even global urban history in the following ways. First, through an examination of how the city center became a site for the contestation and articulation of power between the Asante monarchy and the British colonial government. I show how the location of the Asante palace and local politics, rather than external forces, as we are made to believe most of the time, shape urbanism in West Africa. Second, by examining the consequences of the post-conquest relocation of the palace to the periphery of the city, my work also reveals how colonialism altered African society by dislocating political allegiances and intergenerational tradition through, my, through the reconfiguration of urban space. My findings on urban design and planning in Kumasi ultimately affect how people think about urbanism generally and the history of the built environment specifically. In particular, it calls for a re-evaluation of the global garden city planning scheme by challenging its European and imperial conception, and instead arguing that in Kumase, it had deeper and local roots, and how these legacies of local inventiveness can help us imagine a green future for the city and the rest of the world. So this is sort of the broad overview of, the, of this project. Um, so let's get into why I'm here today, um, beginning with an outline. Um, my talk is focused on the first chapter I've already mentioned this. Yeah, oh. Maybe this one? I don't know. Try the up and down button. Oh yeah. So it's up and down button. Oh. Yep. You're, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So um it's focused on the first chapter. I'll begin by tracing out the origin of Kumase, um, formerly known as Kwame. It's gonna I mean, I, I'm going to give sort of a heads up whenever I'm using Kwame or Kumasi so that you know that, I mean, it's the same, you know, Kumasi will only change from Kwame to Kumasi. Focusing on how local conceptions about its geography inform the designing of the city, I will proceed with the sociology of Asante and its influence on the designing of the town. All right. I was born and bred in Kumasi. Throughout my time here, I have heard many phrases that describe the city in diverse ways. Here are a few of them, which by the way, are still used today. The Garden City of West Africa, the site of imperial resistance, the heaven in West Africa, and Oseko. These and many descriptions are frequently evoked to tell the past of the city, but the majority of these descriptions connect Kumasi with Europe. And that's not helpful in understanding the city in its indigenous sense. This is the puzzle of my talk. In other words, my aim is to understand Kumase as a West African city, primarily built with local ideas to serve local needs in an era of nation building in 17th century West Africa. 
As the capital of the Asante Kingdom, Kumasi was established in a tropical rainforest region within the interior of West Africa in 1650. Its inhabitants developed an urban form that was fundamentally shaped by the shared sociocultural values of the Asante against the backdrop of Afro-European trading interactions along the Guinea coast of West Africa. In other ways, Kumasi was already built as an urban center with sophisticated administrative system by the time Europeans made their first visit to the city in 1817. I wanted to take note of this date. I'm going to get back to 1817 when the European first made their visit to Kumasi. I'll come back to it and make a point. It is important to emphasize that Kumasi had an urban life a long, long before its leaders began commercial diplomacy with Europe. In spite of this, the city's story, even in local imaginary, is mostly associated with Euro European imperial projects and concepts. For example, in a peer-reviewed article, two local scholars of town planning and architecture claim Kumas was established in 1817. Mm -hmm. And obviously, tracing the genesis of the city's life to European arrival. Away from Kumasi, a German public broadcast service, Deutsche World, produced a documentary in 2020 for a global audience. And in it, they described the city as, quote, the capital of the historic Asante Empire and a symbol of resistance to British colonialism. Yet, as I show in this talk, local concepts and needs were fundamental to the shape of the city. Its early inhabitants developed or created structures mm -hmm. and connections that endured crises of war and colonialism. They exhibited great continuity as a building block to the form emerged in the 19th century following interactions between the Asante and the Europeans. This underappreciated continuity is not peculiar to Kumasi. And the observation I've made, and reading from places like Asia, yet normally discussions about urban development in 20th century Africa are deeply situated within European colonial enterprise and local responses. In fact, we as Africans have developed a culture of discussing African secrets, focus on the nexus between colonialism and all its legacies and African resistance and responses. In other words, within the academy, our emphasis on sources produced by colonial dictators could partly explain this normative telling of African cities from the perspective of an entangled relationship with Europe. On the part of many African publics, their everyday experience of the symbols of European colonialism within the continent's landscape similarly influences the understanding of local cities. I give example about the Asante Palace. Like you visited the Asante Palace, now the museum. Mm -hmm. um, when many people think about this palace, they don't really think about the local concept of uh, Asante architecture or Asante Palace. They're thinking about British colonial government building a palace for the Asante. But is that all there is about African cities, especially with respect to design and planning? I do not think so. This is why my research uses Kumasi as a case study to offer an understanding of the essence of this city before and outside of European influences by demonstrating how the local aspirations of a fortress capital city and the respect for societal values inspired indigenous design planning and building. Ultimately, I argue that local needs of the emerging Asante Kingdom shape the urban form of this capital, Kumasi, which as I discussed in other chapters of this project, for those of you who are just joining, this is a bigger project, informed urban planning under British colonial rule. While I detail changes over time in later chapters, the enduring groundwork laid by these early planners continue to manifest in unusual and really significant ways. Now onto my method. I am happy to discuss more about sort of the methods that inform um, this talk or uh, this chapter. But for now, let me share something with you. I hope it is brief. My main source is oral history. Given the timeline of this chapter, 1650 to 1874, obviously, I don't think there's any survivor. So I interviewed individuals who are recognized as sort of knowers of history with official position and access to history that could be maintained and passed over time. I had multiple interview sections with virtually all my interlocutors. And my aim was to return to them with follow-up questions. 
Most importantly, multiple interview sections allowed me to build a sense of relationship with them, especially for the people I was interviewing for the first time. This strategy was also key to gaining their trust about the ethics that guided this research and ultimately the rare asset to the Manisha Palace, which, as I've indicated, is the seat of government of the Assembly Kingdom. I supplement these sources with my own acquired knowledge as someone from Kumasi and through visit and observations of physical sites such as forests, palaces, cemeteries, among others. In other words, I utilize my labor experience as a source and it provides a profound way of reimagining the past. This method is especially useful as a thing for not just Kumasi, but for reconstructing histories of communities with limited documentary evidence, allowing sort of contemporary practices become a sort of mnemonic um, tools for reconstructing or animating the past. In addition, I pursued the examination of the innovative recreating of 18th century town planning design by traditional leaders and private developers in Kumasi. The efforts at recreating 18th, 18th, 18th century town planning design by building houses within artificial forests in contemporary Kumasi does not only show the nostalgia for a West African past, rather it helps us to better appreciate the intrinsic nature of the city and challenges the often elevated European model. The methods are employed, which obviously are locally generated, are important because they provide counter narrative to the conventional histories about the city. All right. Ultimately, I am not just underscoring West African creativity but I show how the thoughtful management of the ecosystem could serve as a framework toward efforts of building sustainable cities in the 21st century. Well, unfortunately, I don't really get deeper into the garden city concept in this paper, but that is the main concept or theory that is um, overriding this whole um, dissertation project. So I talk about you know, thinking about the COVID pandemic and how the imbalances we see in the urban landscape affected certain places and other places. Mm -hmm. I think that like the model in Kumasi in the 17th century could, we could revisit it and help build sustainable cities in our opinion. Roberta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that what we have today are not thoughtful anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in the sessions that follow, I offer detailed discussion of my outline beginning with the origin of Kumasi and how the geography of the region inspired its planning scheme. In the 16th century, so I get a little bit deeper here with certain, I'm introducing some new names and concepts. So that's why I have this here only to take note of it. So I'm going to talk about how Asante started its life, you know. So I'm not going to call it Asante at this point. I'm going to use the subgroup which actually engineered this whole process about building a kingdom. In the 16th century, some members of the Oyoko clan a subgroup of the Asante migrated from their original home in Asante Manso. By about 1650, they had settled at Kwamai in South Central Ghana. Kwamai remained the name of the area for several decades, but in 1701, as we shall see, it will be renamed Kumasi following the enthronement of Osetiku as the first Asante. Okay, Asante is Ken of Asante. Thus, in this section, I'll be using the name Kwamai instead of Kumasi, because I just want to respect, you know, the chronology. The migration covering several decades occurred in several stages. According to Safo Kanchanka, he is a local expert, he's a historian at the Manisha Palace, this decadal progression was due to the strategic reasons of assessing their new environment and measuring what could be migrated. It was also to determine the impact of integration with pre-existing communities in terms of work, and cultural continuity. Kwama was located in an area that attracted huge immigrants because of its valley farmland and rich deposit of gold. Ghana is famous for its gold, you know, Asante is famous for its gold. And it was at this region that community making began among the Asante and allied ethno linguistic groups. The new home of the Oyoko in Kwama covered an expanse of over 6,000 square miles, comprising several independent communities. The Oyoko clan shared borders with other compatriots. I'm going to highlight some of them. I, you know, I don't get deeper into them here, but Dentra to the south was really sort of very, they, they also built a very formidable empire. So they were actually in charge of this region before Asante took over. So it was Dentra to the south, Adansi to the west, and Akwamu and Achim to the east. 
These were all independent communities led by skillful leaders who had accumulated resources and followers. Before the creation of Kwamai, the area had been a vast expanse of forest, subject to the farming and hunting needs of earlier inhabitants, who, because of their close proximity, had claimed ownership of the territory. In occupying this space, contemporary sources, including those at the Mesha Palace, and even for folks on the streets of Kumase, they claimed that um, the leaders of the Oyoko clan secured permission from the earlier inhabitants of the area and formalized all cultural requirements for the ownership of the property, including naming and permanently inhabiting the area. And we, we're going to see this shortly. This was just the first part of the right of ownership involving negotiation with humans. And we're going to see the transaction with the supernatural world. It's also important. Kwama was built within the moist semi deciduous forest vegetation zone in West Africa. This region was locally known as Kwae, literally translated as a dense forest, following a regular norm of naming an area after the dominating natural feature within its physical environment. The etymology of the name Kwama reflects the natural species of green and demonstrates the meaning of the area after the obvious feature of abandoned forests within the landscape. Specifically, the choir combined with Oman, which is also translated as a state, to give to produce. Actually, when we think, I mean, the choir and the Oman, it, it follows this um, sort of the principle that governs um, vowels, orthography, and thinking about those and other important elements of the tree language. So you have the choir and the Oman producing or giving you Kwamai. So that is how the name came about. Kwamai started as a tiny hamlet with a composite of smaller communities that metamorphosed into 77 towns by the end of the 18th century. For the most part, the people who lived here were preoccupied with farming and hunting, taking advantage of the rich vegetation cover and fauna of the region. In this nascent development, two factors informed the naming of the area. A town was either named after the first occupant, who were honored with the founding mother or father sparrow, or, or after the dominating natural elements within the landscape. And as I've earlier underscored, at Kwamai, the region was made up of many independent communities, right? So they were sort of all united under the same physical geography of the tropical rainforest. Given that many communities occupied this region and the fact that each was independent, Naming the area after the unifying geography of abandoned choir eliminated the complexities of the choice of a founding leader. In addition, similar experiences of overwhelming manifestation of the supernatural by the diverse communities within the landscape also informed the name, also informed the naming of the area after its geography. A quiet and calm atmosphere characterized Kwaman's forest for many communities and many communities that they speculated the heavy presence of the gods, deity, and ancestors. I want to blow my nose to it quickly, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Take the time. Oh, oh, yeah, I got more. <laughs> Sorry. So, I mean, I've been talking about. Um, oh, my time is up. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just started, right? <laughs> so, um, really thinking about sort of the the characteristics of sort of the, the region, right? Um, it was very calm, so the local people associated with the presence of the supernatural. So um, I'm going to take that line again. A quiet and calm atmosphere characterized Kwaman's forest and for many communities. That they speculated the heavy presence of the gods, deities, and ancestors. The speculation continued following later discoveries of beautiful natural Truro. Truro is garden. So within the forest, you have we had or they had to, 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 so a garden, and um, 
I mean, as, as they believe, it was mostly bounded by creeks. So not every space you could have, it could resemble a troll, but it has to meet certain requirements before you, you can describe it as a troll. So mostly they want to have sort of a, fair, a four square space. And for each side, you want you wanted to see a creek. And then, um, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, so this, 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 these were some of the signs they look. So um, once they identify a place like that, um, they were they treated this place with all the reverence, all the respect, right? Um, so the speculation continued following later dis discoveries of beautiful natural churros or gardens within the choir, many of which were bounded by creatures. To confirm the veracity of the speculation that, you know, the gods actually live there. Um, some of the communities prepared meals, placed them in pots, and left them in the gardens overnight. The pots were found empty the next day. This method was repeated, and it reproduced the same result of empty pots. The people interpreted it as the gods and deities who ate the food, and to them, it confirmed and symbolized the presence of supernatural forces in the region. And to ensure peace, all the communities that settled in the region performed rituals that secured them the permission to inhabit the area. This ritual performance mostly followed earlier cultural rites, which were specifically executed for the, you know, I already talked about the fiscal recognition. You needed to secure permission. You needed to get recognition from whoever you met in the particular space. And you also wanted to fulfill the spiritual component. So that's local secured property and useful, useful rights through the perpetuation of the spirit owners of the earth. In recognition of this and out of respect for the gods and spirit, the natural vegetation of the city was kept intact. Since clearing or destroying it meant desecrating holy ground and harming the supernatural entities. This conservation became the main guiding philosophy as groups and families went about building communities. It was this philosophy and others that ensured the preservation of Kwaman's green spaces and the beautiful coexistence between the humans and then the, in nature. This philosophy would also sustain a naturally built garden city, as we would later come to know it in the 19th century. That was to the admiration of the many foreign nationals that made it to the city from the 17th through the 20th century. So this is this is the huge argument of. I mean, it's one of the huge elements of my dissertation. I make the point that in 1817, when the British press arrived, Thomas was already practicing this kind of town planning design where they respected the boundaries between the natural environment and then all humans and, and, and nature, right? They respected it. So they designed their communities around the natural environment. You couldn't destroy trees. You couldn't destroy um creeks or rivers to put up, you know, like a structure for humans. No, you had to build around it. So this was the kind of question that these locals were, you know, dealing with as early as the 17th century. And it gets to Europe in the 19th century. Europeans arrived in Kumasi in 1817. They made reports about this layout, settlement design to London. Eventually something comes out in 1898 called the Garden City Planning Council. So this is where I'm coming in. I'm coming from that the idea actually existed with the local people. It assumed a new name, but if you bring it back to Kumase as and we call the city as the Guardian City of West Africa, the fundamental was already there, right? It was already there. You didn't bring anything from anywhere. The supernatural circumstances leading to the occupation of Kwame particularly made the locals develop so much respect for their environments as they feared damning consequences could follow any attempt at harming or desecrating natural entities within what they considered holy grounds. I'm not sure if the historians in this room, I know, I know for sure David is a historian, um, and even beyond, like folks joining um, over Zoom, I'm not sure if you describe sort of this supernatural um, um, story uh, as a myth. I'm not really sure if you're going to describe it as that, but I mean, and sort of potentially assert it um, um, through a kind of nostalgia for a West African past. I'm not really sure if that is what, or sort of 
a cleaner or better world, especially with global warming all over the place. But I approach it as a kind of environmental native narrative because I believe it, given the abundant evidence that Kwama was in fact a green city. In addition, the local people reasoned that the region's forest was wildly grown. So the least they could do was to protect what the gods entrusted to their care. For this reason, conscious efforts were made to preserve the natural environment of Kwama. For effective preservation, I argue that the forest, including all its resources, such as rivers, were partly positioned to shape Asante culture, beliefs, and customs. I get into this deeper in other chapters. I can talk about it. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it in the Hebrew. In the estimation of some of my interlocutors, I both mentioned the palace, state control, we call it state control history, and on the screen. The practices that were invented at the intersection of the forest and all its resources indeed kept the natural environment for many generations until the era of European modernity when things fell apart. That practices involved designing communities and neighborhoods around the natural environment without causing any harm to them. So what you observe in Kumasi, yeah, um, is, is the reality right now, but it is because as they claim um, in the, immediately colonialism took place, mm -hmm. um, the local people wouldn't even respect their traditionally because of, you know, sort of the kind of support they got from the colonial government to sort of um, push back against certain traditional practices, you know, and eventually that is for some of, some of many, many of the people I spoke with on the street, this is how the cities gradually, um, I mean, started losing its green spaces. So they're now the reckless. Actually, the British colonial government actually started it. So from what is today downtown Kumasi, they started destroying all the trees, making way for houses for the colonial bureaucracy. So that is how it started. This is where we are today. And so now, as I talk about the nostalgia for West African, some of the traditional leaders are trying to recreate the 17th, 18th century settlement design. So they call something the artificial gardens if you so they built so many trees in Kumasi and they built houses within these trees. So this is that is how the layout look like. Like you build houses, houses were sort of buried within this huge forest. You could you could barely see the houses of course. Or you could see where the trees. So I'm gonna discuss the last session and get into the details of the local planning design. So I'm going to switch, and I'm going to use Kumasi instead of Kwame. Right? A year ago, in October 2022, I interviewed Nana Boachi and Sadebra, whose name showed on the form above, one of the top chiefs in Kumasi. In this interview, Nana Debra insisted that, quote, Asante indigenous settlement layout was not planned, but it functioned according to local ideas of farming, end of quote. This statement may be true when evaluated within Western modes of town planning concept. But I had a divergent view, and here I'm going to show you what I think. In the period in which Kumasi emerged as the capital of the kingdom, Asante values centered around the family system, that is this sort of moving beyond the nuclear family, think about um, not just the family of spouses and their children, but now you're thinking about relatives who trace a common ancestry such as grandparents, siblings, aunts, nieces, nephews, and the list can go on and on and on. Typically, members belonging to a common extended family live together under one roof in a courtyard house. And this courtyard house is locally known as the Akan Courtyard House. As the family expanded in population, they built new houses around what could be described as the patron house, where the life of a particular family began. Parents and the elder siblings mostly encourage their children and younger siblings to build houses closer to the patron house. In early Kumasi, the agency of staying closer to each other was anchored on considerations for improving population density of a particular area, which was a key step toward the building of city communities. Remember, it was a, it was a, it was a forest. So living in, the, living in this dense forest, necessitated sort of building sizable communities that warded off dangerous wildlife encounters, I would say. 
That the initial attempts at building safer communities involved developing strategies that deterred wild, animal, wild animals from attacking humans. It should be noted, however, that the localities also recognized wild animals as their neighbors, even if they were seen as potentially dangerous and also hunted for food. In the interest of human safety and avoiding of wild guard, avoiding of guard wildlife encounters, the elders discourage children and younger siblings from sort of discovering or relocating to unoccupied territories as they urge them to build around the patron hall. Over time, this practice created enclave of communities within Kumasi, each belonging to a family. That is how it started. And I call this the, the settlement pattern as anti enclave communities. So you had you know, it didn't follow any, uh, it was asymmetrical as I was get into more details about it. It didn't, I mean, I know the Europeans would describe it as haphazard, you know, not thoughtful, not mechanized, you know, disorganized, but it functioned for the local people. We'll get into details why they actually went through both certain, this kind of design. At the heart of an Asante enclave community was concerns for security and cultural awareness. It also, it was intentionally designed to follow an asymmetrical layout as family members build houses closer to each other to facilitate their commitment to sharing resources and information that enable them to defend their communities and eventually the kingdom that they made. There were no links or streets that separated households within an Asante enclave community. In fact, as the locals reasoned, there was no need for a lane or street to separate houses because they felt instead united through the association with the matrilineal descent of common ancestor. They believed they shared the same value and this kept them together during both difficult and prosperous period. However, as enclave communities expanded toward each other, leaders introduced lanes and streets to support sustainable environment through the planting of trees along major streets thereby creating comfortable living conditions for the people, as well as respecting cultural diversity in the capital. Asante enclave communities were also designed to facilitate the easy flow of communication among households and within the state. These households, with houses closer to each other in this settlement pattern, and in an era of frequent wars, real-time information was exchanged between houses without having to leave one's home Right. So in other ways, people could shout information to the other household without leaving the S. At the same time, lanes and streets were introduced to connect the enclaves. These communication routes facilitated the dissemination, dissemination of information as well as efficient resource distribution among the community. The layout of these lanes and streets in turn shaped the planning and designing of commerce as enclave communities got closer to each other. But before lanes and streets were introduced into Kumasi, the most important structure in the city, the Palace of the Asantehim, regulated and guided the rapid expansion of the city, especially when it was declared a capital. Community design and planning in Kumasi involve assigning spaces for the burial of the dead. Asante believe in the existence of the world of the dead and the spirits. For the locals, dying represents the transition from the Asasia, which is the mother earth, to the world of Asamando, the transcendental world. They believe that Asamando, represented physically by cemeteries, is a world where dead people, some of whom become ancestors, continue to live their lives with other supernatural forces. As the locals still argue today, their belief in the supernatural world is evident by the responses they receive from their ancestors and other spiritual entities following the throwing out of challenges during the performance of rituals, such as pouring of libation. Here's an example in chief. So, yeah, this aphorism can be translated as if the transcendental world is a state, that's our prayers. So they have really deep belief for their ancestors. So for this, Nana Deborah, who has been the focus um, or my, my main inter interlocutor for this section, quote, when we make these prayers, 
we receive answers. So we believe the existence of the Asamando as a nation, even though we do not know the exact location until one dies, end of quote. Nana Zebra's faith in the ancestors is a representative of the many Asante chiefs whom I have interviewed since 2014, including Nana Prepper, who was also another top chief until 2019. He served under the, the current Asante. He also it also represents the faith of the broader Asante society. Despite the fact that the exact location of the Asamando world is not known, cemeteries were built not just to represent that world, but to honor the mortal remains of the dead, even if the soul, that is the essence of man, continues personal existence in the digital world. In Asante society, part of the rituals of sustaining the relationship between the living and the dead involved pouring libation at burial sites and feeding the dead with food. Cemeteries, which are considered as sacred sites, provide a space for the continuous interaction between the living and the dead. This is why communities in Kumasi, in Kumasi were intentional about reserving spaces for the burial of their dead. It also demonstrated the interdependence between the living and the dead. For us, the dead relied on humans for the continuous survival of their legacies. Humans maintain relationship with Onyankopo, the supreme being, through sustained exchanges with the ancestors using the cemetery as a platform. Given that humans relied heavily on the supernatural world, building cemeteries closer to communities offered an alternative channel of communication with the supernatural world. In particular, cemeteries facilitated the swift observation of the culture of feeding the dead and the maintenance of regular communication with the ancestors. Still, a buffer zone in the form of forest separated human communities from cemeteries. Yet, this buffer was not meant to protect the living from the dead. Rather, it represented a desire to give ancestors respect by limiting noise and other forms of pollution and activities of humans. In contrast with contemporaneous graveyards in Europe, we we're going to try that. Europe cemeteries in Asante were not cleared of plants. And here too, the capital is led by example. Apart from respecting the ecosystem of the city, cemeteries were left uncleared for two main reasons. First, between the 17th and 19th centuries, not all the causes of death were known. For this reason, people discouraged, uh, people were discouraged from farming so close to cemeteries in order to avoid infection of plants by dead bodies buried within the soil. Second, cemeteries were intentionally designed to terrify unscrupulous individuals who might desecrate homes in search of burial treasures. These treasures took the form of valuable gifts presented to, dead, to the dead during festivals or during funerals for their journey through the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. They represented an important ritual transition for them at, from the earth to the land of the spirit. Royals in particular were buried with gold and other valuable articles. Unclear cemeteries were seen to deter thieves from stealing these treasures. As they developed into thick forests, cemeteries became a sanctuary for all natural and terrifying creatures, including, as it is believed, those from outer space. Thus, cemeteries were not just a sign of respect for the memories of the departed but also showed how the living aspired to maintain an unbroken flow of relationship with the dead, and even when they could not pe be perceived by the senses. Okay. I'm going to wrap up at this point. I'm I'll be talking. Mm -hmm. The topic of why Kumase was founded in the 17th century and its place within local beliefs and cultures is not merely academic, as I see it. These early characteristics produce a speciality and a philosophy that firmly established the form of the city by 1874. Thus, these early features are critical for understanding the form of the city in the modern world. Sadly, the local story of the nature of Kumasi has often been overlooked. Today, when the city is referenced as a site of resistance, this reputation, I mean, as a site of resistance, this reputation is commonly explained in close juxtaposition with this heroism against European, and in particular the British colonial government or aggression, 
However, this story does not provide an absolute representation. Yes, it is true that Kumasi was fundamentally formed to serve the dual role as the capital of, Asante, of the Asante state and as a rallying point for the new nation. In addition, it is true that these two mandates inspired subsequent resistance against European colonizing nations in the 19th century. But it should be noted that these mandates were in turn motivated by the shaping of the city prior to any interactions with Europe. Thus, even though Kumasi fully justifies its appellations as a site of resistance, this reputation is primarily referenced to the wrong base, as I see it, conforming to the pattern of global imperial studies, where European conquests are mostly seen as traitors or um, agents, with Africans merely acting in response as if created de novo by the act of colonization. This characterization has aligned with the divide in urban studies in which cities in the global north define cityness for the rest of the world. Thus, the British colonial government would later claim to have built Kumasi along the planning scheme of London. The portrait of the city from this perspective is popularly held, as well as shaping what limited scholarly research about the city has emerged over the last several decades. But as I have demonstrated, it was the geography and the social organization of the region that shaped the planning of the city. Ultimately, understanding the character and form of the city today requires an ethnic local ideology that is by the genesis of the city. I thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to your questions and comments.